Thank you, Steve. Thank you, team. Good morning, everyone. It is, uh, my name is Craig, if you don't know me. What a joy it is to serve here at Riverside and be able to uh, serve you. What a fantastic morning we've had uh, so far. And if you've been tracking with us for the last few weeks, we started a series that Caesar pushed pause on uh, last week with our uh, youth takeover service. What a great time we had last week. And uh, if you missed it, uh, everything is online. And if you've missed part of the series that we're doing, you can go to our YouTube channel and on our website, and you can catch up with all of our sermons in this series. But we're pushing play again this week on our series called Unstoppable. And uh, if you've been tracking with us, uh, you know we're running quite fast through the series because when you look at the Bible, it's like this beautiful tapestry made up of many, many threads. And what we've been doing in this series is picking on some threads and tracking them right the way through Scripture and seeing the beautiful picture that it gives us. And we've been doing this, these threads on God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Because we know some of our backgrounds, some of our exposures in church communities, we hear the word Holy Spirit and some big barriers and walls come up. And what we've been doing is, is breaking them down as we have been looking at those threads and we're doing the exact same thing today. And as we have been doing with each uh, sermon is we're starting on page one of the Bible as our launch pad for us to go running with this thread through Scripture. And we've done great justice to this passage, but it starts, first few words of Scripture, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without shape and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the watery deep, but the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. Now, I'm not going into all of this. Steve has uh, done a few good sermons on this. But to start our thinking about where we're going is the presence of God was physically moving over the waters. There is uh, God's presence on earth as He starts with creation. It's important that we start to pick up on this thread. So Genesis 1, opening few pages, and we're going to move quite quickly today because there's a lot of ground that I want to cover with this. So the next kind of big moment that we see some of the active presence of God, I want to take us to Exodus chapter 3. And so fascinating encounter. I'm going to read it for us, and we're going to pick out a few things in this quick stop on this thread. And so Exodus chapter 3, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is Moses. He's uh, out in the desert with some sheep in a flame of fire from within a bush. He looked and the bush was ablaze with fire, but it was not being consumed. So Moses thought, I will turn aside to see this amazing sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from within the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. God said, do not approach any closer. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. He added, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, just reading this passage, you're going, Craig, if you were tracking, you're going, there's a couple of uh, contradictory things happening here. This, this isn't making sense. And maybe you would have picked up, but it started with the angel of the Lord appeared in the bush. Then the Lord called to Moses, and God said, where you are standing is holy ground, and then affirms who he is as the God of his ancestors, Abraham Isaac and Jacob. And so there seems to be this contradiction. First, it's the angel of the Lord, fire, burning bush, and then it's God. And it's something that's very, very interesting. And, and why I wanted to stop here is because people go, well, Craig, actually, great proof that the Bible is uh, kind of contradicting itself here. But what's amazing is we're going to see that there is a very clear pattern and very deliberate writing here to help us see something going on, maybe more than what meets the eye. Because this idea, this angel of the Lord, uh, could be translated as the messenger of Yahweh. 
And what is creating, and I, I can't, uh, I could maybe take two hours to go down this rabbit hole because it's so, so interesting, is what happens, what the writer is creating here for us is there is this physical presence that's here with Moses and creating for us this idea to think a little bit more about some of the complicated nature of God. This angel of the Lord who is the messenger of Yahweh, who is like Yahweh, but distinct from Yahweh, who is God, who speaks for God, speaks as God, but is physically present here with Moses. Now, understand this thread and where it's going. God's people are in slavery in Egypt. There is a promise that God makes with Abraham. He makes a covenant with him. He says, I'm going to bless you. Your descendants are going to be a great nation. They're going to have land. There's an inheritance. And through this nation, all the earth is going to be blessed. There is a promise that God makes. And now he's starting to uh, fulfill that promise because we know this character Moses, he ends up becoming the leader of God's people, taking them out of slavery onto that journey. Here's the start of it. And it's an amazing start. It's a beautiful and, and, and a significant start because when God calls Moses, there is his physical presence consecrating that moment because Moses has to take his shoes off because this bush is on fire with God's divine presence. And he says, this is holy ground. The start of this uh, covenant promise being realized with Moses, God's presence with him, physically present. This bush isn't burning. There's divine moment. It's holy, holy ground where Moses is standing. Great Powerful moment, God present with Moses. So we've got the burning bush. A couple pages later in Exodus, Exodus 13, Moses has now confronted Pharaoh. They're leaving uh, Egypt. And in Exodus 13, it says this, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though uh, that was shorter For God said, if they face war, they may change their minds and go back to Egypt. Verse 18, so God led them around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, ready for battle. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Again, can you see the pattern there? The significant moment of creation, there's God's presence involved. He's starting the covenant uh, of Abraham with Moses taking his role in leading God's people. There's divine presence in the shape of fire in this bush not being consumed. They start their journey to leave uh, slavery and to start moving towards their inheritance that was in that covenant promise. And what's there? The physical presence of God who is leading them. Isn't that image just so beautiful? God's people, God's presence. There he is in front, in the day a pillar of cloud, at night a pillar of fire, and he is leading them. He is present with his people. Big significant moment in the journey. There it is marked with the divine presence of God. Couple pages later, the next kind of big significant moment on their journey is when they start to enter into the promised land. God needs to give them some instruction. I am your God, I'm with you, you my people, I'm going to teach you how to live as my people. And so read what it says with me, Exodus 19 from verse 18. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like the smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of the mountain and called Moses up to the top of the mountain. 
And so Moses went up. This is the moment when God gives uh, the law to Moses. He tells him how these people are supposed to live as God leads them. And he gives Moses the Ten Commandments. What a significant moment in the life of Israel. As they are learning to be covenant people. As God is leading them. And how does he mark this moment? of giving them what they need to be His people as He is their God, it's symbolized in this divine moment. Fire descends on the mountain. The mountain shakes. There is the physical presence of God. I was just thinking how brave Moses is and how trusting he is of the Lord as this mountain is shaking. There's fire descended and he calls to Moses and Moses goes up and meets in the presence of the Lord. We know that story. And Moses gets what he needs to lead his people. There is the law and the Ten Commandments. Huge, significant moment. And you're seeing the pattern. Now we've got the burning bush. We have the Exodus. We have Mount Sinai. Key moments in the covenant as God is establishing His promise that He made and He is physically there. There's evidence of His divine presence in those key, key moments. Part of what happens in Exodus 19 is God instructs Moses that now I've given you this, now what you need to do is you need to make a dwelling for me so that I can live among my people takes a while for them to kind of sort themselves out and get there. But we see that then at the end of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 40, God, uh, Moses completes all that preparation. They get everything ready and they set up what's called the tabernacle. As God's people are journeying towards uh, the fulfillment of, of the covenant with Abraham, God instructs Moses to build a dwelling for him. Moses completes all of that and he tells the Lord it's ready and we see this in Exodus chapter 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted uh, from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. And so the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night. In all the sights of all the Israelites during all their travels. Can you see what is being described here? Here are God's people, and there is the presence of the Lord in all of their sights, in all of their travels. Cloud by day, fire in the cloud by night, that God's presence was always with His people. Wherever you see God's people, you can see the very physical presence of God with them, described cloud and fire. It is such an incredible thing to see. And now you're tracking with me. And I want you guys to lock this down because it's so, so important to see this thread. You've got the burning bush. You've got the Exodus. You've got Mount Sinai. You've got the tabernacle. All of these key moments, all of these key shaping times of uh, the history of God's people, it's marked by the divine presence of God. And it's always there shaping for us this key thought for God's people. It's where they are, there is His presence. That was a long period where the tabernacle existed and His presence was always in their sight. They eventually get into the promised land. They have battles that defeat their armies. They set themselves up. We get to some people that you might know, King David. And while there's now peace, they start to make a permanent dwelling 
to move the tabernacle that was a temporary collapsible structure to something more permanent, which would be the temple. And eventually the temple was completed under David's son, King Solomon. We can read because, again, there was some very clear instructions from the Lord when they were to set up the temple. All of these ornate structures, just everything that was to be done and to be made, and uh, Solomon gets everything ready. There's a significant amount of sacrifices and offerings that they present to the Lord when the temple is completed. And you, we see uh, the completion of the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. What do you think happens when the temple is completed? Well, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from the sky and burnt up all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests did not enter the Lord's temple because the, glory, um, because the Lord's glory uh, filled it. What incredible moments. Again, it's this pattern. Every time there is a significant moment in the history of God's people, there is this divine physical presence of the Lord. And now as you track from that moment on, once a year, the high priest would go where? Into the holy of holies, holy ground, into the presence of the Lord. The guy would tie some rope to one of his feet when he went in because if there was sin in his heart and he entered the presence of the Lord, he dropped down dead and they would have to drag him out because God's physical presence was in the temple. So we see the history. You've got the burning bush. You've got the Exodus. You've got Mount Sinai. We've got the tabernacle. We've got the temple. I hope there is some excitement building in you because some things shift after this. Because Jesus enters and Jesus comes and Jesus now starts to talk about a new kingdom and he starts to talk about the kingdom of God and he starts to talk about what he is doing. The disciples don't understand this, but he's telling the disciples, I'm going to leave you at some point but I'm going to send the Spirit. I'm not going to leave you alone. Acts 1 verse 8. Jesus is getting very near to his departure. And he says to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. They, he's preparing the disciples for this next moment in what God is doing. Remember, he makes, uh, God makes a covenant with Abraham. He says to you, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Your descendants are going to be many. You will become a great nation, and through you, all the ends of the earth, all nations are going to be blessed because of you. This is a promise God made with him. We see the great nation has been established. God has established his nation to be a light unto the world, and the next part of the fulfillment of that covenant is happening. Jesus has made a way for, uh, we don't have to make sacrifices in the temple anymore. We know about his death and resurrection and what that means for us as his people, how we can now be in right relationship with him. But Jesus is saying, I'm going to the Father, but I'm not going to leave you alone, right? I'm going to send the Spirit. Now, the next chapter, we see every believer is gathered in one room the followers of Jesus. It's the day we've come to know as Pentecost. And this for me just blows my mind. Because when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Who was the, the they? These are God's people who trust in Jesus. This is the church. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them, 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Look at every key moment where God is building towards the fulfillment of His covenant with Abraham. It is marked by the physical presence of God in the shape of divine fires. He consecrates that time and that moment as He establishes His relationship with His people. It's the burning bush. It's the exodus. It's Mount Sinai. It's the tabernacle. It's the temple. And it is the church. When God establishes the church... They're all together in one space. As Jesus tells them, you're going to be my witnesses to the nations. You are the fulfillment of the promise that I made with Abraham. God sends His holy, divine presence, fire. Now, where does that land? See, because it was on a bush and it was on a mountain and then it was in the tabernacle, and then it was in one space at the temple, but now there's one hang of a shift that happens with how God operates with His presence and His people. It's not just in one place that when it gets up and they need to follow where the presence of God going. No, it splits. And His divine presence rests on every single one of the followers of Jesus Christ who are gathered there because they witnessed His death and resurrection and have put their faith and trust in Him and have started this thing called the church. And the church is gathered in one place and God marks that moment with the coming of His presence from heaven and consecrates that place. Are you getting excited about what this thing that we call church is? This is not just a gathering on a Sunday where you come to hear some cool songs and and maybe enjoy singing and and maybe a nice impactful message and then you look forward to a a good cup of filtered coffee with your friends and a good catch-up. No, no, this is part of the move of God where He puts His presence with His people for the completion of His promises that He gave in Scripture. That is what we are part of. The burning bush, the Exodus, tabernacle, temple, church, all marked by the consecrated blessing of the physical presence of the Lord with divine fire. Luke, the writer of Acts, he's hyperlinking this. They get it. They know what's happened because that's how God has always worked with his people. Look how the church is established. Now Pentecost. Pentecost, the nations are gathered in Israel or in Jer- Jerusalem. Sorry. So many different people get to hear the gospel in their own words. The promise to Abraham was all the nations will be blessed through you. Jesus says, when my spirit comes, you're going to be a blessing to the nations because you're going to witness the good news eventually to the ends of the earth. And they hear that and thousands, about 3,000 people get saved that day and the church is born, and the gospel is going out, and the promise is being fulfilled, the fulfillment of what God started in Genesis with Abraham. We're seeing that today, and we are a part of that. And then I love, and I promise this will be the last passage I read today, because we've covered some significant uh, scripture today, but Ephesians 2.22. We're now out of Israel. We're out of Uh, Jerusalem, where it was all there. And now we're in another town. Ephesus is where now modern day Turkey is. And so now you've got Paul who's writing a letter to these believers. And he says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you fellow citizens with God's people. You're also members of his household. You built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. And in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Can you see how they understood the theology of God's presence from the beginning right up to this moment? how they understood what happened in that upper room in Acts chapter 2, because that's moved from those people to a whole nother town on a whole nother continent with a whole nother ethnic group of believers. It's a kind of wrestling through this. See what it says? Consequently, you're not foreigners or strangers. You're fellow citizens with God's people. 
Man, when he's looking at them as a church, he says, what you are is built on the prophets, Moses. You built on the apostles, Jesus. The chief cornerstone of which this all rests, you are the continuation of God's people and God's presence being built, rising together as this holy Temple, remember, Moses, take off your shoes. It's holy ground. You can't enter the holy of holies. That's sacred ground. But no, you, you guys even here in Ephesus, so far away from where that moment happened, you're being built into this holy temple in which God lives by his spirit. This is the church. Can you even see another extension of the missional implications of Acts 1 8 and Acts 2 and the fulfillment of the promise of Abraham? As I said, another continent, another ethnic group of people, they're experiencing the same thing. The church, which we are a part of. Man, this excites me. And this is so much bigger than an hour on a Sunday. This is why we say, and you, you think, you, sometimes I think people get irritated when we go, the church is not a building. And I hate how we have the habit of, I'm going to church. And I know what we mean when we say we're going to church, but the church is so much greater than a physical place because God's presence isn't in the physical place anymore. It's in those who have come to faith in Jesus Christ who have put their faith and trust in Him, who believe that He is Lord, that uh, He rose uh, from the dead in victory over sin, shame, and death, that we worship Him as our Savior. Remember, when God's presence came and consecrated those places, it was because they were ornate buildings done to very specific criteria with huge amounts of sacrifices that were burnt up as a pleasing offering. When that was all in place, that's when his presence came down. But how significant is it that it came down on people who had put their faith in Jesus? That shift is so important because for me, I have genuine access to the Father. Do you know why we say that? Because he physically made it possible and proved it as he made the church his holy dwelling. Where it's God's people, it's God's presence. When he says, the sheep will know my voice. How can I pray to a father and know that he hears me? Because he lives in me and in you and in this thing called the church. It's where God dwells by his presence. And so I have access to my Savior, my Father. There's intimacy because nothing separates me. I don't have to go to a building. I don't have to enter into some other place. Nobody goes before me into that place where His presence is. No, what He established in the consecration of the church is that I have a relationship with the presence of God. My Father is in this place. I am a follower of Jesus. And so I get to know my Father. The Spirit of God that's hovering over the waters, that spoke creation into being, that led His people by a pillar of fire and cloud, that rested on a mountain, that gave uh, Moses the law, that then moved in the tabernacle, that came down in fire in the temple, came into the church, and I am part of that because it's built on the prophets, it's built upon the apostles, the chief cornerstone that is Jesus and is continuing with me and you today. This thread is so significant because what does John see when he is taken and given a a, a snapshot of heaven? This is where this thread ends. What does he see as he sees the throne room? He sees a great multitude that no one could count. Made up of who? every tribe, every nation, every language. The promise that God makes to Abraham, I'll bless you, I'll bless your family, you'll become a great nation. All of the people on the earth are gonna be blessed through you. We see the move of God's spirit as he establishes all of these key moments. It gets to the church and he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, this is gonna have implications to the ends of the earth and every single nation is going to be blessed because of what is gonna happen when my presence comes upon you and this church is established. And when we see the fulfillment of that thread, what is there? A complete finish to the promise that God made. What we are a part of 
is so significant. This local expression here on, on Smart Copies Road in the south of Johannesburg that meets uh, at this time when we gather is part of God's divine promise for the world. And when we gather, when we do this thing called church, the nations are going to be blessed. And what God is doing through us here, we see the completion of that in Revelation. They're worshiping because it's unstoppable. This thread, this presence of God is going to have its completion in the nations worshiping Him. This gospel is going to reach every nation, every tribe, every language. And we, we get to be a part of that. We're going to have communion. This is what establishes the church. It's his death and his resurrection. His body broken for the forgiveness of our sins. It's his blood poured out. It has established for us the opportunity to trust Him with our lives and to call Him our Savior. It's what marks us as His people. Not our ethnicity, not our physical location, but faith and trust in Him. And this is moving all over the world. And it doesn't stop. And so church, as we're going to go to this time of communion, I, I, I want us to think about this because, and I've said it before, I don't attend a church service if I have faith in Jesus Christ and I trust Him with my life. I am the church. And that shift is so important. You might go, but yo, Craig, I'm not one of those Holy Spirit people. Keep that away from me. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but I can't. I cannot separate God's presence and the Holy Spirit from you as a follower of Jesus Christ. It doesn't exist because to be a part of the church is to be the dwelling place where God lives by His Spirit. You can't separate those things. And he says, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be His witnesses. The reason that we have the Spirit, Steve mentioned, I pray for greater gifts. He, he gives us what we need to keep establishing His kingdom so that the fulfillment of the promise ends with all the nations hearing about what He's done. And so I want you to think about where you're at with this thing called the Holy Spirit and church and it's so much more than just hearing a message, singing some songs and talking to my friends with coffee. Do you understand what happens when you risk on a Sunday and go talk to someone you don't know? You know, just to not maybe boil that down to something that you might think as insignificant as that. But what we're doing here is so significant. What we are is so significant. And if you go, I don't know that person. Maybe let me go and risk and talk to them. And a relationship is made and you're inviting them as maybe a mature believer. What are you inviting them into? Not just a church gathering, maybe a sermon and some cool things. No, it's this thing that God established in the beginning that's going to continue on for all eternity. There's so much more at stake when we choose to go, maybe I'm not going to give in to all that horrible talk at the office and I'm going to give hope to how the world's going to end because I'm actually going to talk about the fact that I have hope in Jesus. And when you risk, it's so much more significant because of what you're risking for and what you're inviting people into. And when you're generous with what your resources are, you know, it's not just a pat on the back, I did my thing. Tick, uh, hey, I'm a, I'm, I'm a good person. No. You're sacrificing into the mission of God and He's using you and what you have and what you're stewarding is the completion of the promise of God. If you invite someone into your home, if you make friends with someone who doesn't look like you, isn't in your maybe your same uh, financial bracket or your, your, your same people group,